from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hi again, welcome to the show. So let's start with a piece of hyper local news that orphaned not so pretty house down the end of my street that's been abandoned for who knows how long was reborn this week. The boards came off the windows, the tradespeople were seen coming and going. So is it possible that economic recovery is slowly arriving a few blocks from the Jefferson Park Blue Line station? I'm telling this because we lost every block this week and we're sorry NBC decided it just wasn't enough, uh, you know, it wasn't making enough money and they shut it down. So that's our effort to be every block, my block. So anyway, we've got big issues this week on a much larger scale. The president's on his way to Hyde Park Academy. He'll be talking about urban violence and how to begin curing it. Maybe by the time you've seen this show, he's already come and gone. Mayor Emanuel thinks he's got a breakthrough in the pension crisis with a police union just not with the big police union. We'll see how that works out. And of course, we have a new number, 129, the number that will live in infamy. That's how many Chicago public schools remain eligible for closure as, as this very public and very loud process begins to grind forward. Helping us to go through all of this today, two very highly respected journalists, Folks, I'm just so happy to have on the show Dan Mialopoulos from the Chicago Sun-Times back again. How Pleasure. you doing? Great. And of course, our old friend Dave Shaper from NPR uh, Chicago, the NPR Chicago Bureau. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, let's begin with the 129 number just because it's the top of the news as we're taping this morning. Um, Barbara Bird Bennett uh, unleashed a, a, a tiger here when she said we're going to have this public, this very public process, and boy did she get a public process. So the, the prospect looks to me like they're at 129 now, they're applying nine criteria, they'll get it down further and further, and they'll probably get it down to around 20, and they'll close about 20 schools, and everybody will say, this is wonderful, we had a public process, we got the number down to 20, which is about, what, four times more than it's ever been before. So a victory for the Emanuel administration, I can't see it any other way. Well, I, it, it's, a, it's an interesting process that they've rolled out. I think that they have tried to get out in front of it because of, they've take, taken so much heat on this issue uh, the last couple of years. And, you know, this goes back, really, uh, Renaissance 2010, remember yeah. that under Arne Duncan, Absolutely. which he started in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, was, a, was a slow, methodical process of closing, underperforming, and underutilized schools. And mm -hmm. it kind of continues and it rolls on. Uh, but, you know, during the whole teacher contract negotiations, this figure came out. What, wasn't it mm -hmm. about 110 or yeah. 120? Yeah. And, and that's that's where we're at right now. And yeah. so uh, they've figured out a way, it looks like, as, as you kind of suggest, to uh, make it not as bad as it may have initially seemed to, right. to some of those. But a lot of schools are going to close, a lot of changes for a lot of families, and uh, a lot of changes for teachers, principals, and, and it's, a, it's a big change to the system. It's the Rahm Emanuel way. You come in and say we're going to have to do two million five hundred when he knows the real number is going to be about a hundred, and, <laughs> and then you negotiate down until until he looks like the hero because he gets what he wants. It's it's very very good tactic, I have to well, say. We've seen that on a number of issues. Yeah. I'm trying to think of one offhand. Um, last year, when NATO uh, was going to have its summit here and did have its summit here. Uh, there were a bunch of measures that they initially introduced and then right we're going to uh, make you all stay in your houses and we're going to come and lock the doors i don't think it was that extreme <laughs> now, Ken. obviously you're being sarcastic but uh yeah. there was a rollback and then ultimately a compromise we've also had a compromise of sorts with the city council on the ethics measures that the mayor wanted to apply mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the members of the city council which they were of course very very reticent right right and i think there were three different uh occasions where they scaled that back so in the end he has compromised in some wonder was that what he wanted in the first place anyway so i mean uh i, I don't want to spend too much time on the schools because you guys are, are here to talk about a lot of other issues but i mean th we are we are going to see some grief when this when this number finally is announced there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be very unhappy and um, there, there will be people, there are now, who will say that this is all being driven by an effort to try to improve the situation for charter schools. I mean, we saw yesterday, um, my mind just went blank, who was it? Uh, um, 
I forgot. Anyway, one of the, one of the aldermen uh, is trying to get a, a, a moratorium on charter schools. Well, I think 35 of them signed on to it now, whether they vote yeah. for that yeah, you know, yeah. is another matter. Yeah, and, and the argument being made is that, uh, you know, at a time when we're, we're having diminishing resources and we're trying to close schools, you're adding more and more charter seats. But of course, there are a lot of people who think that's a good idea. There are two different things there. I mean, you're looking at undercrowding, I guess, or under uh, right. attendance at, at some schools and, uh, and other places you're looking at overcrowding. And so I think some of the people that are getting money to build charter schools are saying, well, in certain areas, particularly in the northwest side and the southwest side areas where the Hispanic population has grown and mm -hmm. uh, the Hispanic student population is, has grown accordingly, uh, that you have overcrowding and you need new buildings there. But certainly the, the larger criticism of this whole effort to close many schools is not focused on the fact that um, there are fewer students or that there's not a lot of money and they're looking to save money. They're, they're looking at it as saying, well, how is there no money to keep these schools open mm -hmm. when you're providing money right, right. to build other schools or to operate other schools in the well, case we, we of CPS. Well, really, we really can't, <coughs> we just can't leave at this point this, this whole conversation that you started, you, uh, you and the Chicago Sun-Times, uh, about UNO, <coughs> which is, of course, one of the, I think they're the biggest charter operator in the city, aren't they? Or if they're not, they're certainly close. Right. Um, <coughs> and how, I, I mean, th there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, your, your story had very deep impact, in, including the uh, resignation of a top officer at UNO. But the thing that I found most, I'll say, troubling about all the things that you revealed in your article is the fact that you have one organization that has that is so politically powerful in this state that it has its own line to the Illinois General Assembly and got a hundred million dollars for the building of charter schools. Now they're fine schools, they're beautiful schools, they probably do a good job, but how come that hundred million dollars didn't go to the Chicago Public Schools to improve all these neighborhood schools? Well, a tiny correction first. They asked for a hundred million dollars. They only got ninety-eight million. I'm sorry, you're right about that. <laughs> but, I, I, but my apologies. How did they I do it? Mean, yeah, I mean, how did they do it? And is it a good public policy on the whole? I mean, what they did initially was they took a lot of the parents at the schools that they had already. I think at that time they had about thirty-five hundred students. They took a lot of them down to Springfield. Mm -hmm. They bust them and their kids and they, um, they pressed their legislators. But they also did have a lot of clout, like you said, the old fashioned way. Right, um, right. It wasn't really. Because, a, excuse me, not, not to interrupt, but, but CPS and the unions and other, they've had plenty of people going down to Springfield too, but they don't, they don't seem to have the clout that, that well, Uno they, has. They don't have the same lobbyists, for one thing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, let's not forget, One Run Hell became an ally and, and a friend of Mayor Emanuel after they got that $98 million. Mm -hmm. He was then co chairman of Mayor Emanuel's Mayor campaign. campaign. But right. certainly, Mayor Emanuel has uh, been very vocal in his support for what they do at those schools. Mm -hmm. um, he more recently said after our stories ran about the insider uh, contracting and the crony contracting that they need to be held accountable and do things in the right way and that he would support them if, if they do things in the right way, uh, which was uh, rather cryptic, I thought, but, but clear. Give us, a, give us a, people. a thumbnail of, of what you discovered with the, uh, the in, insider uh, politics and financing of, of UNO and the schools. Sure, in a nutshell, we looked at that $98 million in school construction grant money that they got from Springfield in 2009 through the efforts of their grassroots activists and their lobbyists. <laughs> and their grassroots lobbyists. And yeah. we looked at how they spent that money. They are indeed building schools. They've been able to expand their network. They now have, uh, I don't know if it's the biggest one, uh, as you said, but they have 13 schools with 6,500 students, so they've uh, expanded their reach tremendously. They're building another school with that money, and there's still going to be 15 million left over. And they want to get more still. They've asked for 35 million more recently, and um, Mike Madigan reportedly, the Speaker of the House, is in favor of them getting that allocation, although it hasn't happened yet. Um, some say because of the negative publicity recently. They operate in his community. Well, they, they do want to operate in his community. They do want to build a school in his community, but they operate in a lot of communities, uh, northwest side, southwest side mm -hmm. primarily. Uh, there's another new school in Rogers Park. And in a nutshell, uh, what happened was we found that a lot of those contracts were going to friends and family of UNO uh, executives. Uh, you mentioned Miguel Descoto, the number two, or he was the number two until a few days ago. 
uh, two of his brothers had uh, very important contracts. Uh, if you've seen their schools, they have these very shiny uh, stainless Beautiful uh, steel uh, mm -hmm. plates and large windows, and those were put in by one brother of Miguel de Scotto, and, and he subsequently uh, resigned. Uh, their, one of their lobbyists who helped them get that $98 million grant, his sister got a subcontract there, and uh, also the brothers of one of the uh, legislators, Eddie Acevedo, who voted in Springfield to give them that money. Who actually they voted on the $98 too. million. Dollars. Yes, yeah. he voted yeah. for it, yes. Yeah. And, and I guess we should say that I don't think in your story you, you say that anything that happened was illegal necessarily, right? I mean, well, it's, it's, a, it's a, what, it's a sort of, a, it's a not-for-profit organization. They can hire anybody they want. They're not exactly. Um, they did not have to have a bid process. The state never required that. Had they gone to Springfield under the program that school districts have gone to for the last 15 years and gotten money to build a school, they would have had to have a sealed bid process and open those bids at a public mm -hmm. bid opening session. Mm -hmm. They weren't required to do that, and they did not do that, um, although they say they did some sort of bidding on some of the contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know exactly how, but we know it was in a sealed bid process. Uh, so um, did they break the law? That all comes down to how you construe the conflict of interest clause that's in their grant agreement. And, they, you know, you can take a look at it. It's pretty typical legalese, and mm -hmm. I think you can certainly find uh, one lawyer somewhere who thinks it, it's a violation of that clause and one lawyer who doesn't. And we don't know yet how the Quinn administration, which also has been very supportive of UNO, mm -hmm. will construe that activity in light of that clause that they agreed to follow. It's very interesting to me, I think, to, to, to see how there are rules in place, but there are not the same rules in place that if this was a regular public school, if this mm -hmm. was a, 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 you know, a pretty powerful principal at, at any other Chicago public school, mm -hmm. uh, that they would not have the same leeway in terms of hiring their, their brother to, to put in the brothers, windows yeah. or to, uh, yeah. to even to hire a, a family member to, to, to sweep the floors. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but it's not unlike, you know, some of the shenanigans we saw at the Board of Ed when I started covering it some 20 years ago. And we had the first school reform law and we created local school councils and a lot mm -hmm. of these small local school mm -hmm. councils, uh, I don't want to say all of them because a lot of them did, did phenomenal work, but there were some that, that quickly set up uh, to be little fiefdoms where LSC chairs were hiring uh, friends and mm -hmm. neighbors and relatives to, to do certain types of things or to get certain kind of contracts once yeah, they got yeah. that kind of budgetary authority over their yeah. schools. So it, I see, st <laughs> I'm, I'm getting cynical, but uh, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah, we well, just got an updated yeah, yeah. new version of, of, uh, of what many people might just say is old school Chicago corruption. Uh, th that is one of the great disadvantages of growing older in these jobs <laughs> is that you just see it come around and around and, and it, yeah. But you know, one of the, one of the points that I've been hammering home on, uh, on this little show for, uh, for several weeks now is that it's interesting to me to see that Miguel Descoto, who was the uh, transportation commissioner for the city of Chicago under, under Mayor Daley and, and is, you know, a very politically connected guy. Nobody's saying he's incompetent or anything. He's, he's, a, he's, he's done a, he's a pretty good record. But he was being paid $200,000 as the number two guy. He resigned from that position. And I don't understand, uh, th this, is, this is something that's very hard for me to get my hands around, is that you have a, a, perhaps the largest, one of the largest operators, they're running 14 schools or whatever it is. That's tiny compared to, the, to the CPS. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody at CPS who's being paid $200,000 a year. Well, so, I think uh, Barbara Bird Bennett is making the same as uh, her predecessor, J.C. Brizard, which is two hundred fifty thousand a year. I'm sorry, I apologize. And that, by the That's way, right, is the right. exact I was amount. It was under two hundred. Yeah. Yeah, two hundred fifty thousand is the exact amount that Juan Rangel, the CEO of Uno, makes. Miguel was the number two senior vice president. He mm -hmm. was making until this week two hundred thousand. And uh, there's uh, also um, their chief operating officer, uh, Phil Mullins, who's a childhood friend of the Uno co-founder mm -hmm. Danny Solis, you know, now mm -hmm. an alderman, right. he's making, I think, in somewhere around 187000 mm -hmm. if memory serves. So that has been an issue for some critics of charter but schools, it, absolutely. But also, that money is public money. That money is being derived from taxpayer money in some way, form. Well, it varies from uh, charter uh, network much, to charter network, anyways, but anyway. in the case of UNO, yeah, it, you're talking about um, mostly 
you know, either state money, which is going for construction actually, mm -hmm. or their operating money largely comes from Chicago public schools on a per pupil basis. Yeah, they, yeah. they allocate money to charter operators. Uh, and now the charter schools will argue they get less per pupil, uh, much less than the, um, uh, they, they estimate 75% of what a, a normal public school will spend yeah, per yeah, pupil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's a, a very good series of stories you did. Uh, it had great impact, and uh, congratulations to you and the Sun-Times on that. Um, David, you've been doing some really good reporting on the situation in Chicago with urban violence, gun violence, uh, so much are going on. And of course, obviously, you guys will be covering the president when the president arrives here. Um, I, I'd like to just throw this question out for you. He, he was eloquent on the State of the Union address. He, he, he talked about all this going on a mile from his house. He got people standing on their feet and hooping and hollering. But in the end, is he going to be able to do anything to change the situation in Chicago? Interesting that he used the words, they deserve a vote, when talking about uh, Hadia Pendleton's parents, how he, when he talking about the parents and, and survivors of Sandy Hook and in even Aurora, Colorado and other other mass shootings that we've seen over the years. Uh, uh, and and he never said a vote on what. He, they deserve a vote, but he never actually mm -hmm. said, this is what mm -hmm. I want this Congress to pass. Mm -hmm. And I think that he recognizes that he's got a very difficult task ahead of him in trying to get significant gun control legislation through, through the Congress. Uh, d w w as I understand it, this is all gonna have to start in the, in the Senate, there's going to have to be some sort of compromise on, you know, the, the assault weapons piece seems to be one of the more difficult things. Uh, WBZ had uh, Senator Mark Kirk on yesterday. He's leading the, the, the charge mm -hmm. from the Republican side of the aisle mm -hmm. uh, in the Senate in, in sponsoring the legislation, but, but seems very uh, doubtful that, that the uh, assault weapons ban that so many uh, Democrats seem to want, so many police chiefs seem to want, uh, mm -hmm. so many of the survivors groups and other gun control groups seem to want, um, uh, it will, will, will be able to make it as part of the package. There seems to be a little bit more support for something that would, yeah, that would yeah. be more universal background checks. Um, and, and, you know, I, people talk about the assault weapons and, you know, how you define this, the assault weapons. We've seen a lot of great reporting over, over the last several months about how, how you define an assault weapon, how it was defined in the original 1994 assault weapon ban, mm -hmm. and how the manufacturers were able to get around that and, and produce guns that, that had pretty significant firing capacity. And then, you know, there's the third question about, uh, you know, this, will it have any of these things have a significant impact on gun violence, particularly the type of gun violence that plagues neighborhoods in, in Chicago? And I, I do wanna, I, I feel like, and this is my, uh, getting my hackles up as a, as a, as a local, you know, Chicago, and uh, that we have a significant problem here, but uh, our gun violence uh, uh, murder rate is, our gun, murder rate is significantly lower than, than several other cities, including New Orleans, Atlanta, uh, St. Louis, uh, Detroit mm. in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not, you know, we, in a per capita sense, the mm -hmm. murder capital. We've just gotten right. a lot of the attention. Right. And, and, and the thing that, uh, that, you know, the common denominator that uh, so many of these communities have is, is hard times, is poverty, significant poverty, mm -hmm. high uh, levels of gang activity, mm -hmm. uh, cyclical poverty that is, uh, you know, led people into, into generations of, mm -hmm. and, and a culture of violence that, that, that no simple law is, is going to tackle. And mm -hmm. I think that we have seen, because of these bigger incidents, a Sandy Hook in Aurora, Colorado, uh, a, a sort of doubling down effect of, of researchers and, and people who want to get at the broader problem of, of gun violence and what leads people into situations where they feel the need to have weapons mm -hmm. and to use weapons in, in a bad way. So um, I know some of, the, some of the measures that the president has talked about and is, is pushed and, and even through his executive authority uh, tried to spur Will will foster some development along those lines, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think I think it's it's a lot of people are clamoring for answers to the to the gun violence problem, and and certainly the president wants to push something through Congress, and I think it would be a great defeat to him personally if he doesn't get at least something through. Yeah, but yeah. the significance of it is is you know I hate to say it just remains to be seen if it if it will really get if he'll get everything he wants and if it'll have a significant impact. 
I thought you were going to say. You know, the, I, I noted uh, today that we're, we're recording this program on Valentine's Day, which just mm -hmm. happens to be the grim anniversary at uh, Northern Illinois University. Right. Where the shooting there was five right. years ago. And, uh, you know, as horrific as that was, five people were killed in that, in that auditorium. And your colleague, uh, Ira Glass, is just starting a, a series of programs now uh, on This American Life and uh, talking about Harper uh, High School uh, in Chicago. And over the last year, eight of their kids, their students, former and recent, uh, have, been, have been killed. Uh, Twenty-some people, 25 yeah. people have been shot. 29, 29. If you, and if you include recent graduates, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a pretty staggering statistic. Yeah, if it yeah. had been all in one place right. and certainly all at one time, mm -hmm. everybody would know and the that, name that's Harper High School. That obviously is, is that, the, that's yeah. the point, is like Har Harper High School would be, would be as well known as Northern Illinois University or any of the other shooting. Uh, but it wasn't, an, these are not assault weapons and they're all Not happening much. a little at a time. So we, we're really talking about two very different problems here, it seems to me, and, and the one that we have is, I don't know, I wanna say worse, it's, it's a more intractable problem because, because it is rooted in pathological social problems like poverty and, and loss of jobs and disinvestment, whereas the other seems to be rooted in mental health issues and other you know kind of lone ranger type problems you know i think back to um shortly after i graduated high school and, and the shooting of of benji wilson the star simian basketball yeah, player yeah great and, documentary and and, and and i and i've yes, caught yeah. bits and pieces of it and i i always go back to that moment as as you know I, as people thinking that that was going to be a seminal moment yeah in, yeah, the, in yeah. the fight against gun mm -hmm. violence and what did we see in the, through the 1980s we saw the gun violence rate go up in Chicago. The murder rate the peaked in, in the early 90s, in mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. crack e epidemic years of, of the early 90s, mm -hmm. 92 or 93, I think, maybe it was even 94. 970 mm -hmm. homicides we yeah, had a year yeah. in the city of Chicago. We're down to, down to 500, and that's that's the highest we've had in, in, in four or five years, yeah, this, this yeah. last calendar year. So, uh, you know, his, from a historical perspective, the, the, the violence the murder problem is not as bad, but it is so concentrated in so many in certain neighborhoods where where it is such an endemic problem. You're mm -hmm. right, Ken. It's just it's it's intractable in some ways that it's, you know, and and I, you know, to have a Hedia Pendleton happen. What is it? 25, 26 years after a, a Benji Wilson. Mm -hmm. And, and pull the same heartstrings to right, for right. many of us that, that happened then, but have so many of these nameless, faceless kids yeah, uh, yeah. and adults who, who are caught up in gun violence. And, uh, and you have this, this interesting phenomenon where almost everybody wants to do something about it. I mean, and no matter where you are on the political spectrum, everybody wants to fix this problem and nobody seems to have a clue about how to do it. And every, every time somebody comes up with an idea, there's 15 people ready to say, no, that can't, that can't work. I, I just recently interviewed um, uh, Otis McDonald, 79 years old. He's the man who fought to overturn the handgun ban for yeah. the city of Chicago. Uh -huh. See what he thinks about the president's proposals and, and those sorts of things. And he, 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 f a fascinating, interesting, uh, sweet gentleman. Uh, he he simply just wanted a handgun to protect himself. He mm -hmm. he hears gunshots at night. Right, right. He uh, sees the toll it has taken. Not not and, and not so much even in his own neighborhood of, of Morgan Park, which isn't uh, as violence plagued as some. But he sees mm -hmm. things turning. He's he's seen the change over the years wants to be able to protect himself. That doesn't mean he doesn't support background checks and mm -hmm. uh, increased mental health screening for, for those who are yeah, trying to yeah, purchase firearms. Yeah. He, he actually does, and there's a lot of things he, he likes. I think a lot of people are, are like that, you know, whether they, yeah, they yeah. want to have their, their own guns for their own protection right. uh, or, or not, they, they do look at the bigger picture. And, and, and the, you know, the bottom line to him was, you know, the kids out here who are causing the trouble, they need jobs, they need an education, they need, right. their families need more support. Yeah. Too many of them are growing up in broken homes. Yeah. Uh, too many of them don't have the community support that, that he says he had when he was growing up. Yeah. But really, when you look at everything since the 80s, there's two, two things that strike me in terms of the trends. Yes, uh, you had a decline and now something of a rise again, although not to the old level. But you've had declines all over the country. And what's particularly striking to me is how the declines here or how the recent increase here, I should say, is so much 
uh, going against the pattern in mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. large cities like yeah. New York, although yeah. not in some other yeah. uh, somewhat smaller cities like St. Louis and uh, Detroit. But everyone's always said, hey, Chicago didn't end up like Detroit. Some many thank Mayor Daley for that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you look over this whole period, and the other trend that strikes me is um, you talk about the concentration in certain neighborhoods of the problem of violence and how intractable it is in certain areas. And when I looked at, at a map of where these uh, murders are occurring in the past year, and you look at the neighborhoods where it's concentrated, I, I thought back to a story we did four or five years ago, actually, when I was at the Tribune of where the um, building permits were concentrated, or where the zoning changes, I should say, were concentrated in terms of new construction. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, a whole new city did emerge in right, this period absolutely. from the, right. the you know mm -hmm. early 90s, particular right. mid 90s, but a whole other part of the city wasn't touched by Never. the yeah. rising right. tide right. of the economy right. when it was strong and right. now with the economy down again. There's so much more to talk about here because, you know, uh, the mayor and uh, uh, Ms. Alvarez want to uh, increase the amount of time people spend in prison if they're caught with a gun. Uh, it, it, th again, that seems to me like, yeah, that, that's a good knee-jerk response, but we already have so many people in prison now. Do, is putting more of them in, you know, I mean, that's a complicated, that's a 15-minute conversation that we probably don't have time for. And that's assuming that the courts and the, and, and exactly, the, you know, exactly. The prosecutors and the judges follow through on yeah, those, yeah. Um, I, those I measures. I think it's worth mentioning that Chicago gets this reputation for having among the toughest gun laws in the in the country, when it really hasn't. And, and Superintendent mm -hmm. McCarthy likes to hammer on this all the time. Mm -hmm. In New York, they do have these mandatory minimums. And a guy mm -hmm. like Plaxico Burris, mm -hmm. who carried a loaded weapon into a into a club mm -hmm. illegally, shot mm -hmm. himself in the leg, still spent two years in prison for it. Mm -hmm. And and we don't have that. Yeah, the capability yeah, even, yeah. nor the willingness it appears in the court system, and and our jails are are overburdened, are overcrowded, and, mm -hmm. and that's another consideration. But yeah. but there is something to that, and and there are significant laws. And the other thing that that New York City has is neighboring states such as New Jersey and Connecticut that have strict gun laws as yeah, well, yeah. and have where we don't have that same sort of thing in, in we, suburban um, Indiana and Wisconsin. <gasps> I really wanted to talk about pensions today because mm -hmm. you've done such good coverage. Both of you have done, and and you know the mayor's doing this thing with the police, and we've not we've just completely eaten up our entire program talking about this. But I think it's important, and I and I'm glad we did that. We also should mention that uh, as we're sitting here, it's quite likely that the Senate, uh, the Illinois Senate, is passing the uh, marriage equality uh, today. So this could be historic in that regard too. But we don't have time to talk about that either because we're so hung up on violence and what's happening tearing our city apart well, neither issue is going away soon that's so. right so maybe you'll come back maybe yep. we'll talk to you guys Absolutely. about some more yep. dan thank you so much dan milopoulos from the chicago sun times and uh david shaper from national public radio chicago bureau right here so ha happy to have you both on the show and uh, we end on a kind of a somber note, but happy Valentine's Day anyway. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can find us right here on cable, but you can also see us online by going to the very address that you see right on your screen. You can watch us any old time you want. And of course, you can always uh, podcast us too. We'd really like that if you would do that. Thanks for watching. We will be right back here, whether you like it or not, next week at this time, right? We'll see you then. Thanks. <laughs>